Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the drug treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so we're continuing our discussion of the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, the DMARDs. We've done methotrexate and we've done sulfasalazine. The next one I want to talk about is penicillamine. Okay, right. So I firstly want to discuss the structure of this, and then that's really all I'm going to be able to tell you about, because the mechanism by which penicillamine is effective against rheumatoid arthritis isn't really known at all, basically. Okay, so the drug structure, it's also called dimethylcysteine, so it's very similar structure to the amino acid cysteine. So I'll show you the structure of the amino acid cysteine, and then we'll look at how penicillamine is just a modified form of cysteine. Okay, so uh, the structure of cysteine then, here is the amino group of cysteine, here's the alpha carbon, okay, here's the carboxylic acid group, so that's the core amino acid structure. Now, the R group of cysteine is that you have a methylene group, like so, and then you have a thiol group coming off here. Okay, so this is a cysteine amino acid. Now, the structure of dimethylcysteine, which is another name for penicillamine, uh, is uh, you ha have the exact same core amino acid structure. All you change is the R group. Okay, so draw out the core amino acid structure again. So here's the carboxylic acid group. Okay, now the R group is going to be almost the same, so you've still got the carbon with the thiol group, but these two hydrogens have now been replaced by methyl groups. Okay, so that is why this is called dimethylcysteine. Okay, and the other name for it is penicillamine. Now, it is a breakdown product of penicillin, uh, hence the name, and it does appear in the urine if you're taking a penicillin antibiotic. Okay, right. Uh, so... Firstly, let's talk about the fact that there are two separate optical isomers of this, because only one of them is going to be used to treat rheumatoid arthritis, okay? Uh, so, the one which is used to treat rheumatoid arthritis is the D isomer of penicillamine. And there are two optical isomers, because this carbon here, this carbon here has four separate different groups coming off it. So this carbon here is what's known as a chiral center, and basically there are two enantiomers of uh, penicillamine, okay, so two optical isomers, and they're more than just optical isomers, they are actually enantiomers, mirror images of one another. Okay, so this is the chiral center here. Right, so uh, many different amino acids have two uh, optical isomers of one another, and this is an amino acid, dimethylcysteine or penicillamine is an amino acid, it's not one that's used in proteins, but it's still an amino acid, amino acid isn't a biological definition, it's a chemical definition, okay, so you've got this structure, so you are an amino acid, whether you're used in proteins or not. Okay, so, um, Basically, this optical isomerism here that you've got is the same optical isomerism problem that you have in all different amino acids, except for, of course, glycine, where uh, the R group is a hydrogen there coming off the uh, carbon, and therefore it's not a chiral center because you don't have four different groups on. But usually, when you have a, a funny R group here, you do have a chiral center here. So let me show you uh, the two different... Uh, amino acid structures that arise. So I'm just going to show this uh, structure here as the R group, basically. I'm not going to draw it out in full. Okay, so basically, if we draw a 3D structure now, so here's the alpha carbon, which is the chiral center. We're sticking the hydrogen that comes off the alpha carbon up here. Okay, and we'll stick the amino group behind us over here as well. Okay, so let's imagine that all of these are within the plane of the piece of paper, basically. Now, that's perfectly plausible to do that. Now, the other two groups, which are the R group and the carboxylic acid group, they cannot be in the piece, plane of the piece of paper now. They're going to uh, either come out of the board or go into the board. So one's going to go into the page and one's going to come out of the page. Okay, so either you can have the carboxylic acid group going into the page... So I'll just write Q for carboxylic acid group. Okay, and then you can have the R group coming out of the page towards us, like so. So that's one optical isomer, or 
the other optoisomer. Let me draw the other one now. So again, we have the alpha carbon, this hydrogen coming off the alpha carbon, and the amino group all within the page. And now the other optical isomer is the other way around, basically. You have the R group going into the page, and then uh, the carboxylic acid group coming out of the page at us. Okay, like so. Now, these two molecules are not the same. You cannot turn this one into this one without performing a chemical reaction. Not without breaking this bond, breaking this bond, and swapping the two around can you turn this one into this one. There is no way that just by rotating this molecule, or changing the way that you look at this molecule, that you can turn this into this. Okay? So they are two fundamentally separate molecules. Okay? So they're called optical isomers of one another. And they're more than just any old optical isomer of one another. So optical isomer is a huge term that covers a huge number of different uh, isomerism uh, cases, okay, which are far more complicated than this. These two are beautiful optical isomers because actually this one here is the mirror image of this one here. So if this one was to look in the mirror, the molecule that is in mirror land would be this one here. Okay, uh, so when that occurs, the two are called enantiomers. So this is an enantiomer, and this is the other enantiomer. So this molecule, dimethylcysteine, has these two enantiomers. Right, uh, so how do we name these two enantiomers? Well, basically, there is a nice naming system, okay, which you can analyze. You can analyze which ones, uh, the, which of the two isomers by looking at the uh, order in which these groups occur, basically. So imagine you are sitting where the hydrogen is sitting, and you're looking down at these groups. Basically, try and read the word corn, okay? So you get the CO from the carboxylic acid group, okay? So you start here. So in order to read the word corn, we're going to have to start here. Then find the R, so that's over here. So we're going to have to move from the carboxylic acid group to the R group. And then finally find uh, the N, which is the amino group. Okay, so to read the word corn, we had to rotate our head in a clockwise direction. Now, if you had to rotate your head in a clockwise direction to read the word corn, if you were positioned up at the hydrogen, then that uh, enantiomer of the amino acid is known as the larvorotatory uh, enantiomer, okay, or simply just as the L enantiomer. Whereas, to read the um, corn here, what we're going to have to do is here's the CO, so we start here, then we'll go to the R, so we'll go round to here, and then finally to the N. So this time, our head is rotating in an anti-clockwise direction. Okay, and when you have to rotate your head in an anti-clockwise direction to read the word corn, that's called the dextrorotatory enantiomer. Okay, so the form of uh, dimethylcysteine, or penicillamine, that is actually used to treat rheumatoid arthritis is the dextrorotatory enantiomer. So basically, imagine filling this R group in with this carbon, with two methyl groups and a thiol group coming off it, then that is the enantiomer of penicillamine that you are uh, going to actually give to people for rheumatoid arthritis. Now, again, it's quite an effective drug in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, but its mechanism is not known, basically. Okay, so I can't really say much more about it. Okay, so this is either very unsatisfying, uh, or it's very, very nice, depending on your viewpoint. If you just like learning the names of drugs and what they use to treat, then this is very nice. If you like understanding the mechanisms, uh, then uh, this is very unsatisfying. Okay, and I'm afraid it doesn't get any better with the uh, next ones that we're com coming up to. Okay, so we're going to turn our attention from penicillamine now to the gold compounds, the next uh, category of disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Okay, so there are two main uh, compounds that involve gold which are used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And these two compounds are the only drugs which contain gold which are used in Western medicine. 
Okay, so one is called uh, sodium orophiomethate. So sodium orophiomethate. Okay, and that methate that you see there is the same methate as you may know from the um, uh, Krebs cycle. Okay, and the other gold compound uh, that is used is oranofen. So oranofen. Right, so I'm going to show you the structure of sodium orophiomethate uh, because it's quite simple. It's a nice polymer, basically. It's a, it's a massive great molecule. Okay, so let me show you the monomer that's repeated over and over again in sodium uh, orophiomethate. Okay, so firstly, here is the gold atom. Okay, so the symbol for gold is AU, and it will have a covalent bond going off this way, and then it will have another covalent bond which goes to a sulfur atom, and then this sulfur atom will be linked to the gold atom of the next monomer along. And then off this, you'll then have the malate group. Okay, so uh, the structure of malate is basically a four carbon carboxylic acid molecule, okay, where you have carboxylic acid groups at either end. Okay, so I'll draw its skeletal structure rather than its uh, molecular formula. Okay, so here are our one, two, three, four carbons. Now you need to have a carboxylic acid right at the end here. Okay, so this is the skeletal structure of a carboxylic acid group. Okay, and then off this carbon, you've only got two bonds, so the other two bonds will be to hydrogens. Off this carbon, you've got three bonds, so the other bond will be to a hydrogen. And off this final carbon, you need to have another carboxylic acid group. However, this carbon is going to, well, this carboxylic acid group is not going to be a pure carboxylic acid group like this. Instead, it will have donated away its proton and will therefore have a negative charge on this oxygen and this oxygen will be associated with a sodium uh, cation. Okay, so you are going to repeat this monomer over and over again. So you put a little N there to say repeat this and positive integer number of times. Okay, so thiomalate means this malate molecule with a thiol group stuck on it. But of course we haven't got the thiol group still there. Instead it's bound to gold on both sides now. So this one will obviously be bound to the gold of the next one along over here. Okay, and then this gold will be bound to the sulfur here and it will continue on basically. Okay, so that's sodium orophiomalate. Now this drug is given by intramuscular injection, okay? So it's not given orally, it's injected into the muscles like insulin. Okay, so it's given by intramuscular injection. Whereas oranofen is given by uh, oral administration. Okay, so this one's given by oral administration. Now the mechanisms of these two drugs are not really known, especially not for sodium orophiomalate. Oranofen is known to decrease uh, the production of interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Now remember, these two uh, proteins are two incredibly powerful pro-inflammatory cytokines. Okay, so what maintains the chronic inflammatory response that you have in the synovial uh, joints in rheumatoid arthritis? Well, it's uh, these autoantibodies that are being produced against the autoantigens. They come in and they bind to that autoantigen, and then this activates sentinel cells, either directly by binding to the FC gamma receptors on the surface of the sentinel cells, or indirectly by activating the uh, compl classical complement cascade and producing anaphylatoxins. It basically activates them to, in to release pro-inflammatory mediators which act on the endothelial cells and maintain the inflammatory response. And two of the key mediators that they release are interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha, which cause type 2 activation. So by stopping the release of these, that may be how it achieves its uh, anti-inflammatory effects in the uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, and both of these drugs, they take months and months to actually see an effect. So you have to take them for around three to four months before they will actually start to take effect. But once you have taken them for three to four months, their effect is actually incredible. Okay, so they are very, very powerful drugs. Okay, so the final member of um, the DMARDs then, 
which are the anti-malarial drugs. Okay, so I uh, told you about chloroquine when I initially listed the um, anti, sorry, the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. But you can also use its related compound, which is hydroxychloroquine. Okay, uh, now these drugs are usually used to treat malaria. That's their other great use, uh, and they're not particularly nice drugs. They have quite a few horrible side effects um, and again their mechanism of action is not known but chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are uh, effective in the treatment of anti uh, in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis okay but as I say their mechanism just is not known so I don't really have anything other to tell you about them other than their names and that they can be used to treat rheumatoid arthritis which I know is terribly unsatisfying Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of anti-rheumatoid uh, drugs.